during the Brodsky series for library preservation and conservation. Um, we've had some really good speakers over the past years, and today we're going to have Holly Kruger speaking about the preservation of the Herblock cartoons. Um, it gives me great pleasure with this program in particular. It's kind of a nice wrap up of our cartoon collection processing project here, and Susan Klein who is our project archivist, will introduce the speaker and the topic in general. Susan? Today we have Holly Kruger with us from the Library of Congress. She holds a master's degree and certificate of advanced study in art conservation from the Cooperstown Graduate Program. Over the last 25 years, she has worked for several cultural institutions and also as a private conservator. Holly held the position of Paintings and Paper Conservator at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and was Senior Paper Conservator at the Amon Carter <coughs> Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. While at the Amon Carter Museum, Holly led efforts to develop preservation and emergency preparedness plans and designed the museum's conservation lab. In 1992, Holly became Senior Paper Conservator at the Library of Congress. Holly works with objects from all divisions of the library and is the divisional liaison to the prints and photographs and Asian divisions. She has served as the team leader for the Advanced Paper Internship Program and the Herblock Project. In addition to her work with cartoons, she led the organization of flattening and treating over 1,000 Chinese rubbings from the Asian Division. Since 1979, Holly has been a fellow of the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works. She has also guest lectured at the Winter Tour Program for Training in Conservation. Holly is also the co-owner of the Kruger Art Conservation of Kruger Art Conservation Incorporated. Clients with that include the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, and the Mount Vernon Estate. And I'm looking forward to Holly's talk um, because as an archivist, I process collections. Um, I do not do conservation work aside from minor things. I, ca I can't unfortunately um, do anything that detailed due to the time constraints of our two-year project, but Holly, I think, will explain the other extreme of going to the going to into great detail of what you can do to preserve cartoons. So welcome Holly. I just wanted to note that um, Susan is cartoon archivist, right? Yes. <laughs> The Library of Congress has one of the largest collections of and most active scholarly programs engaged in the arts of cartoons and illustrations. With over 138,000 prints, drawings, and paintings, a collection spans the entire genre. Some of the earliest groups of materials at the library can be found in the British cartoon print collection and date from the mid-17th century. Over 9,000 prints represent an era dominated by the prodigious talents and prolific efforts of such famous caricaturists as James Gilray and George Cruikshank. The cartoons highlight aspects of British political life, including tensions with its colonies and other nations, as well as society, fashion, manners, and theater. The Library of Congress purchased the vast majority of the prints in this collection from the Royal Library at Windsor Castle in 1921. The collection is notable for its breadth and quality of the impressions, and the depictions of British life, but also for its close association with the British royal family. The Prince of Wales, later George IV, built on the collection created by his father, George III. The two monarchs shared a passion for satires and acquired contemporary works, as well as those from er earlier periods. On occasion, <clears throat> when confronted by a particularly offensive royal caricature, they attempted to suppress distribution of the offending cartoon by purchasing the entire edition and the plate from which it was printed. <laughs> this practice is evidenced by several Windsor caricatures which bear the inscription suppressed below the margin, uh, in the image below the margin. The American Cartoon Print Collection <coughs> is an assemblage of more than 500 prints made in America during the 18th and 19th centuries and encompasses several forms of political art in colonial and early American history. Examples of early political expression in cartoon include Join or Die, created by Ben Franklin, not what you see on your posters these days, um, 
It was first published in uh, the P Pennsylvania Gazette in 1754, and Ben Franklin would not like how he, it's being used today. Paul Revere's depiction of the Boston Massacre was published in 1770. This print became widely available just 21 days after the pivotal colonial event, which was amazing in that time. It is credited with popularizing anti-British public opinion. The original publication by the Gazette is the earliest known pictorial representation of colonial union rep produced by a political uh, British colonialist. The Cabinet of American Illustration contains more than 4,000 original drawings by American book, magazine, and newspaper illustrators made primarily between 1880 and 1910. It includes illustrations for uh, magazines, novels, and children's books, cartoons, cover designs, and sketches for posters. More than 200 artists are represented, including Charles Dana Gibson, my favorite Charles Dana Gibson, um, <laughs> Elizabeth Shippen Green, Oliver Herford, and Jesse Wilcox Smith. The collection was the brainchild of William Patton, art editor for Harper's Magazine during the 1880s and 1890s, who established the Cabinet of American Illustration in 1932 in cooperation with the Library of Congress in order to create a national collection of original works of art documenting what he and others considered the golden age of American illustration. The cabinet helped to establish value to the original drawings and paintings used in illustrations. Prior to this time, original drawings produced for publication were very often discarded after use. This well-publicized effort inspired others to begin retaining drawings and to take steps to ensure their survival. Um, Jesse Wilcox Smith gave these large, lavish, lavish drawings, which are color plates for her water babies in 1916, and are among her most lavish and admired works. I love that one. Art Wood, an award-winning cartoonist himself, began collecting original drawings at the age of 12. During a period of 60 years, he contacted and befriended numerous older masters of cartoon art forms, as well as leading contemporary creators in the field, and obtained selections of their work primarily by gift, but some by purchase. During his professional life, uh, Art Wood worked diligently to establish a museum or gallery <coughs> to preserve and showcase his collection. He achieved this goal in 1995 with the opening of the National Gallery of Caricature and Cartoon in D.C., but it closed in two years due to lack, lack of funding. Undeterred, <clears throat> Wood turned to the Library of Congress, where he had worked at, at very early in his career uh, to preserve and, and present his collection. The collection is particularly rich in early comic strips, such as this Mutt and Jeff from 1914, which I know you have a lot of now. And who can top Flash Gordon? Alex <clears throat> Raymond created Flash in 1934, and it's been much imitated since. George Lucas credits Alex Raymond as a major influence in his Star Wars. And Winsor McKay with his dark and often surreal Little Nemo in Slumberland. One of my favorites, George Harriman, Crazy Cat. And this uh, Chick Young, it's the um, Blondie cartoon strip uh, where he gets married, Blondie and Dagwood get married. And ironically, uh, they knew this cartoon was very important, so they kept it in a wooden box, which is why it's so dark. <clears throat> the collections also include masters of modern and contemporary comics, George, uh, Charles Schultz and Gary Trudeau from when he actually drew his strip. And the incomparable Lynn Johnson's For Better or Worse. The library has a strong collection of caricature. This is by David Levine, whose work uh, was published in such diverse venues as the New York Review of Books, The New Yorker, and The Rolling Stone. And one of my favorite Cobra Rubiuses. The collection is especially strong in the genre of <clears throat> editorial cartoons and holds many original drawings for the masses which was a graphically innovative magazine of socialist politics published in the U.S. from 1911 to 1917, when federal prosecutors brought charges against its editors for conspiring to obstruct 
constri um, conscription. Robert Minor revolutionized editorial cartooning in the years before World War I by introducing new media crayon and ink brush to a field dominated by pen and ink illustrations. This technical innovation, derived from the work from such European masters as Goya and Daumier, enabled him to create spare, forceful drawings, including his masterpiece, Pittsburgh, drawn for the masses during a 1916 steel workers' strike. This is St uh, Stuart Davis's watercolor drawing published in 1918, and the masses. Girls Wanted uh, by Henry Glickenkamp comments on the Triangle Shirtwaist Company fire of 1911, which came to the public's attention again in 1916 as investigators issued their reports on the tragedy. Bill Malden was a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning editorial cartoonist from the United States. He was most famous for his World War II cartoons depicting American soldiers Willie and Joe, two weary and bedraggled infantry troopers who stoically endured the difficulties and dangers of duty. The cartoons were broadly published and distributed in the American Army. The library holds over 2,000 drawings by Malden, including this Pulitzer Prize winner. The collections contain editorial cartoonists working today, such as Pat Oliphant and Ann Telness. And this was published two days after 9-11, which I think is, says more than any newspaper article could. <clears throat> and this is another by Ann Telness, um, which is a perfect segue into our hero of the day, Herb Block. Herbert Lawrence Block, or, or as he is better known by his pen name, <coughs> Herb Block, was born in Chicago in 1909 to a family active and supportive of the arts, politics, and civic action. Herb Block began his own reporting and cartooning career in high school, and at just 19 joined the big leagues of political cartooning by joining the staff of the Chicago Daily News. He joined the Washington Post in 1946 and went on to chronicle the nation's history in that position for 55 years. In addition to working tirelessly for the little guy and having unparalleled editorial freedom, Herb Block um, chronicled, uh, was one of the most influential political commentators and editorial cartoonists in American history. His long chronicle of major social and political events began to appear in newspapers in 1929. And he continued to document domestic and international events for 72 years. It's amazing. His first published cartoon, this is his first published cartoon, which was done in 1929, could be done today. He would uh, in, um, demonstrate his incredible prescience for events throughout his career. He was an early advocate of aid to the Allies, resisting Nazi aggression at a time when the mood overwhelmingly favored appeasement and isolationism. This cartoon is dated January 3rd, 1941. And Herb Block won his first Pulitzer Prize for this cartoon in 1942. It literally saved his job since he was about to be fired for his increasingly left-leaning tendencies when word came in that this cartoon had won the Pulitzer Prize. The editor very couldn't fire him then. Herb Block coined the term McCarthyism in this cartoon from 1950 and relentlessly pursued bringing that dark chapter to a close. And Herb Block was never a fan of Richard Nixon. And I can't look at a um, money bag without seeing Richard Nixon's face in it anymore. <clears throat> and Herb Block was the first to explicitly link the burglary at the Watergate to the White House in this cartoon from 1972. And this is my favorite cartoon of the 14,000. And I've been channeling Herb Block since 2001, and I, I just had to add a little something that I knew <laughs> he would approve of. With the gift of, in 2002 of the Herblock archives from the Herblock Foundation, the library acquired over 14,000 drawings and 50,000 roughs representing the vast majority of his over 70 year career. Now I would like to speak about the preservation issues related to cartoon and illustration <coughs> art. The first thing to keep in mind is that the drawings were done for publication and not seen as an end to itself. 
The late great cartoonist, LA, uh, LA cartoonist Paul Conrad visited the library in the late 90s with giving us a gift of cartoons. And I asked him about the materials he used in his drawing and he said rather impatiently, it's not a drawing, it's an idea. And while that point's hard to swallow for institution and collectors, it's well worth remembering that. While cartoon drawings have increased, have increased in value exponentially over this century, many have been executed without longevity in mind. Large illustrations are often on illustration board, a multi-layered <coughs> structure manufactured for such purposes. Typically, the surface is comprised of a good quality paper, but the interior core is uh, simply ground wood pulp. The back of the board also has important uh, publication information compelling the argument retain, to retain uh, the board intact. The boards become very brittle and can easily suffer handling breaks. While disassembly of the board is an option, we've accepted the notion that the board in its entirety is the object, not just the image. To provide support for the brittle structure, a sink mat is constructed to house and display objects. The housing structure should allow for the board to remain unflexed. A favorite support for, for, for cartoonists have been the commercially available layered paper boards. These smooth, stiff supports are comprised of good quality paper layers, usually three or four, that are adhered to one another with um, a water-based adhesive. The chop mark is also visible, such as this identifying Strathmore either side. They're stable and tend to hold up well. Unfortunately, there's all sorts of mayhem that can happen with even the best materials. This cartoon consists of five strips of the Strathmore <coughs> either side, but it's been pasted together with um, a staining type of tape. And rubber cement is a favorite material um, and tends to darken over time. Every, all conservators are shaking their heads at this one. Uh, it tends to darken in a very dramatic fashion over time. Not only does it um, discolor over time, but it loses, I'm going to try this. It's it use of power as well. And um, so anything stuck on with, um, with rubber cement is going to fall off. Horse point pen or felt tip pens have been around since the 40s, and the, their ubiquity and ease of use have made them a favorite of cartoonists. Unfortunately, the dyes used in these pens is notoriously fugitive to light. Components of the dyes are highly mobile as well and will sublimate through the substrate and move into the next cartoon. Identification and isolation of cartoons with porous point pen is key to their preservation. And then there is a question of corrections. In this cartoon, Bill Malden wanted to broaden his point to include Congress and not just JFK. This, um, this was pasted over JFK in, this, in the original cartoon, but it had fallen off and luckily not lost because a lot of times it's lost. Um, in that case, what we do is we hinge the, um, what has been published over the original idea so that both versions are available to, um, to scholars. So another uh, Bill Malton showing the use of correction fluid or whiteout as media. Um, this white foamy is whiteout and it um, doesn't stick very well to uh, the, the media underneath. Her block used many types of correction uh, methods. George Bush's lips are constructed of several layers of graphite, blue pencil, correction fluid into which he inscribed. There's also a, a patch of an adhesive label in there somewhere. His, his assistant explained that they were readily available Avery labels. My favorite cartoon, again, showing the um, adhesive labels used to correct a passage. So. A second fact about cartoons and illustrations that's useful to keep in mind is the tyranny of the daily deadline. The cartoonist had to produce a cartoon every day. In Herb's block, Herb Block's case, he did this for over 70 years, resulting in over 14,000 cartoons. Cartoonists have gravitated to materials that support quick execution of their ideas. And this uh, uh, cl uh, close-up of Herb Block cartoons, 
there um, are papers that are have uh, texture impressed into the surface, which are commonly referred to as coquille or stipple paper. They catch the friable media easily to make shading fast and easy. And her, here's her block using the side of a litho crayon to make the shading on one of these papers. And it's nice when they uh, put on the bottom a note to the, to the publisher <laughs> that it's going to be friable, not to smudge it. Another favorite material of cartoonists are the boards that are treated to develop, to develop out a pattern when a fluid is applied. In this case, the background shading was accomplished with a brush and two different provided fluids to develop the lighter and darker dot patterns. The product Duo Shade by Grafix was available and widely used in the 60s. The problem with these is that the dot patterns tend to fade over time. Another time saver are the pattern shading films such as Chart Pack used by cartoonists and archivists and uh, architects. The pattern, <clears throat> the project, this, the paper, uh, the, the film has a pattern printed onto a transparent film with an adhesive backing and then you can um, rub it onto the area that you want to transfer this uh, film onto. The problem with these is that the films discolor over time and fall off, and we'll see all of these things tomorrow in the workshop. What we do is, uh, when they're still around, we um, remove the discoloration as much as we can and then stick them on with, a, with an archival glue. And as an example of preservation of the cartoon collections at the Library of Congress, I would like to share with you the steps we took in the Herb Block Project. When Herb Block died in 2001, he set up a foundation to manage his estate and continue work for his causes. The foundation donated his entire collection and archives to the Library of Congress with whom Herb Block had had a long-standing relationship. Perhaps most importantly, for purposes of preservation, they also donated funds to ensure that the cartoons would be accessible and preserved for all time. We were given a five-year window to assess, treat, and house the collection, but first we had to see what was there. The trustees were most anxious for us to, lit to visit Herb Black's house where the bulk of the drawings were stored. A team from the library arrived at his Georgetown house where he'd lived as a bachelor for 50 years. We got into a small elevator stocked with bourbon and descended into the basement, which led to a small room in the back of the cor in the corner of the basement. And inside we found virtually all of his 14,000 original drawings and many of the 50,000 original roughs. Stock stacked on tables, in cabinets. They were stacked chronologically, but <clears throat> There were also thousands of rough sketches in file drawers. While the room did have an extra lock, and there was a dehumidifier in the room not working, the trustees were most anxious for us to transfer the collection to LC. Once safely in our vaults, we began the process of planning for the uh, collection's preservation. The first step in devising any preservation plan is assessment. Miraculously, the drawings themselves were in really pretty good shape, except for the roughs aren't in good shape. To understand how best to, do, to preserve the drawings themselves, we needed to understand the materials. Fortunately, there had been a Look magazine article in the 60s with many photographs documenting a typical Herb Block day. Through these photographs, we were able to understand the process by which he produced his drawings. First, he would start with sketching out the rough sketch on just uh, newsprint paper. And he would get several ideas out and then he would take them to the editor. Notice his cigarette. He was a big smoker until he had a heart attack in the 70s. Then he became a big anti-cigarette person. So all these cartoons in the 70s on are anti-smoking. Then when they've decided what drawing they want to, um, the rough, a sketch that they want to produce for a drawing, he would start by penciling it in, and then inking the design up, and then finishing by um, shading with the side of a litho crayon or a graphite a crayon. 
We were also fortunate to gather some of the materials, including the pencil box that was on his desk. We g began by uh, surveying the collection again and performing stabilizing treatments, such as tear repair and dry cleaning. A few draw drawings required more in-depth uh, treatments, such as consolidation. All of the correction materials that don't stick, they do have to be stuck back on later. <clears throat> the most important thing with this particular collection is we had to design uh, housings that would accommodate the fragility of the, the drawings, the friable surfaces of the drawings, and um, keep them from flexing. So we needed to have individual housings for each drawing um, that we could photo corner the, the drawing onto, and then it has a smooth surface translucent paper, so you don't have to keep flipping open the housing to see which drawing you want to look to. So 25 of these housed drawings then were put in a box. For the rough sketches, we didn't have money or space to uh, individually house or treat the, the rough sketches. We'd really like to digitize them, but there's hasn't been money for that yet either. Um, so what we've done is we took off, there's all sorts of um, pencil drawing or pencil markings and uh, um, eraser crumbs and also this black material that was on all these drawings. I couldn't figure out what it was until his assistant came and it was chocolate. He loved chocolate. So there were <laughs> Hershey chocolate crumbs all over. So I brushed all of those off and then put them into uh, these acid-free file drawer or uh, <clears throat> folders and put them in these boxes. And here are the um, drawings, all safely tucked away in their uh, in their acid-free and climately controlled space at the library. And I'd like to thank William and Joan Brodsky for providing this opportunity, and Peter for inviting me, and Susan for the all the cartoons you pulled out for us for tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs> We use a, um, it's um, a methyl cellulose, and uh, for that particular type of material, it works really well, and you thin it down. We have certain methyl celluloses that we use when we thin it down and apply. You have to do it, it's, um, you have to do it under the microscope to see, to apply the consolidant exactly where you want it. No, no, we couldn't do that. And we, we can only, um, as they come up for exhibit, really, we look at them really closely. And if we, if we saw one as we were processing them, we would set it aside and consolidate it. But we couldn't go through each one and look under the microscope. A lot of them are OK, so most of them are OK. How does the SCU Her Block collection uh, compare with others around the country? The SU? Syracuse. Do you have heard blocks? Um, uh, about two or three. Oh, is that all? Almost all of them at the library. Because he kept almost everything and did not give away or do many um, shows. So there are not many out there that aren't that he didn't have in that in that basement. <coughs> so at lunch today we uh, talked about the difference way that You know, um, I don't know that it would have been that different because in this case, the Herb Block Foundation gave us this, these funds. So we were able to hire staff to process the collections and we were able to um, buy, design and, and buy the housing for them. So really they, I don't know that I would do that much more to them than what we did. So we were very, we were very lucky. Um, the, the housing cost almost $100,000 for 14,000 uh, cartoons. 
So I, I think in this case, we had, we had the best of both worlds. But in other cases, you do, we have to, um, you know, we have, um, for example, the decision not to disassemble uh, cartoons or the illustrations on board is made because we want to see that as, a, as an object, but also there's no way we could disassemble all those things. So it's a little bit of both. Um, part of the original gift is that um, some her block has to be displayed in the Jefferson Building at all times. So we have uh, creating the U.S. and there'll be a her block cartoon here at all times. But also we have mounted since we got the collection, we've mounted three major um, exhibitions in house. Um, so and I'm very involved with that. Um, in fact, in the last one that we did that celebrated his the anniversary of his hundredth. Uh, 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 his 100th birthday, um, we are undertaking a scientific uh, initiative to, to study the drawings. And now that, now that we're finished with the 14,000 and they're all tucked away, now I get to actually really look at them. And so we're starting to analyze the materials in a more scientific way. We did hyperspectral imaging of seven drawings before, at three months and at six months, we took seven drawings out and did hyperspectral imaging of them. And we can characterize them, uh, the, me, uh, the media much more and what, what changes might have happened as a result of the exhibition. We haven't seen any. The next study that we're going to do is on thermal aging, which is the aging that will occur in dark storage, in the storage. So we're, gonna, we're in the process of designing that study. Was digitization included in processing? Are they not? No, about a third of them are digitized, and um, it's not included in the original. It's not seen as part of the preservation, but uh, pres preservation digitization is a big part of the library. So they try to, like for every exhibit, they digitize and. Um, is it ongoing? Are they intending yes. to put all of them? Yes. Yes. But everybody's crying for digitization dollars, so you know. Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 So how are they cataloged for researchers? Would someone have to be looking at the old Washington Post and come and say, I want to use this? Or are they just are they listed by title or topic, by date? Or well, there's been a major publication. Are you, um, there was a major publication accompanying the uh, um, exhibit last year, and it has all the drawings in them. So, so you can do it from that. But also on our website, which I'll show tomorrow at the workshop, um, all the ones that are digitized, you can see, and they're done by year and subject. And who owns the copyright? Washington Post or Her Block Escape? Or it, that's um, a tricky, it's, we don't own everything outright, and I couldn't tell you. I thought that we wouldn't be able to see the Her Block drawings here at Syracuse, because it says on the website, the internal website, that only you can only see the, the images internally, but you can see them here. So I. I, d I don't really understand that. <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, I, I have a question. How, how old was he when he died, and did he work right until the end? Yes, he did. He uh, his last cartoon was like July of 2001, and he, he did know about 9/11. And he died just after that. Um, was that? How old was he? He was 96. An illustrator, so he's illustrating a um, part of a story in picture form. And mm -hmm. her block is more. Of, I mean, he's an editorial cartoonist, so I think I think um, Paul Conrad's admonishment to me: it's it's not a drawing, it's an idea. That kind of talks about that. But then comics are sort of in the middle, you know. Um, they're a joke, you know. They're, that they're supposed to to give you a joke. So, so many other genres. Caricatures are supposed to capture, you know, the essence of a person in a particular style. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Is this the largest collection from a single cartoonist that the Library of Congress has? Yes. Do you by chance know what the second largest one is? By a cartoonist? By Bill Malden. And how large is that? That's 2,000 drawings. So there's a big difference. We don't usually take archives mm -hmm. um, or would take a collection like that, but we did in her Block's case. We took everything. And we'd have a lot of his archives, and we have his, his newspaper morgue, which is just this great thing to look through. And we don't normally collect that, but, but he was so central to Washington and the whole story and the U.S., the whole story, anyway, and, and Congress, um, that they felt that they made an exception in this case and took everything. So what then would normally happen? Would the collection be split between the <coughs> and... Mm, I don't know. I think we'd be more selective, but not in his case, because you want everything. But in, if somebody came and said... I want to give you our collection, we wouldn't just take it. Right, but if it was somebody. Like if Paul Conrad wanted to give his things, we'd probably take most of that stuff too. <laughs> but um, no, we're pretty selective in what we take because we have, um, we just are running out of space. But that would be determined by who the person is rather than these are manuscript materials, you know, they're papers and we only want the artwork or we want everything. Yeah, I think we we would more tend to take the artwork, but if the manuscript material supported it in some way, then yeah, because okay. we, we, we still take a lot of archival materials too. Right. So I know that line is so blurred. We were talking about well, that. No, so what too. you're saying is just being selective in general yeah. of the person uh -huh. and who they are and what they represent, yeah. and then decide based on that. Yeah. What yeah. Know. Basically. Well, <clears throat> we, um, preservation is a process. It's not something that's ever finished. So we saw that as getting them out of, stuffed into drawers like this, getting them out, the chocolate off of them, and putting them in a way that somebody could actually look at them was a big step forward. And whether some more will happen, I don't know, because um, each, they're, they're on newsprint paper, and they're very brittle. So the amount of resources that would be required to um, treat each of those so that a casual researcher could handle would be astronomical. So I don't know that anything more will be done with them. But uh, the goal, I know the curator directly, the two curators directly associated with this collection would love to have them digitized because peop now they're the only people that are allowed to, to look at them. And they'd love to have that material out there. <laughs> We did, we did a few like that, okay. that were crunched up at the bottom of the, you know, box or something, so. And the first box that um, the curator, when we brought them in, and they were sitting on my desk, the first box he came to were all the water games. <laughs> I was just like, well, this, this stuff's important, you know, yeah. Did you find that with the, as you're doing the exhibits, that <coughs> requests to use the materials went up dramatically? Um, They've, it's been heavily researched from day one. Uh, it, it, yeah. And I don't think it was accelerated by the exhibits. What is access to the collection? Is it researchers or is it just researchers. people who go into the library? You have, to, have, you have to ask. And a curator shows it to you, basically. Like a special but collection where you would request entry and so on? Yes, at okay. the prints and photographs. Um, you, you know, curator would show them. But, the, the great thing about the digital age is it, a lot of it's accessible. All the images are on a CD. The, if you buy the, the book that went with the last um, um, exhibit, they're all on there. So, <laughs> kind of amazing. Are there plans to make a commercially available compilation of this relatively small selection of his work? Well, I think the book might, I mean, fills that void. The book, uh, there, the the book that it had all the pictures, but it well, it the the her block book, which it's in the other room. I wish I had. I should have brought it here. Um, 
if you buy the book, it comes with the CD that has all the images on it. Yeah. And I, it's not out of print yet, so, but I think it might because it's been very popular. So they might have to do a second edition. In fact, they are going to do a second edition to it, I heard. Yeah. I thought I might speak to some of these questions. Oh, yeah. shy to brag, but she is our cartoon archivist, and um, many of the questions that have been asked speak to the kinds of things that we do up on the director of special collections here. Um, so Susan's working <coughs> on a two-year grant that's through the new National Archives to process all of the Syracuse's cartoon collections, which we didn't know how many we had. When we applied for the grant, we thought we had 164. 134. 134, mm -hmm. and we had over almost 200. Mm -hmm. And how large and total uh, originally it was 450 linear feet, but it's actually over a thousand linear feet. So a lot of stuff, <laughs> and um, and many of these questions have come up, uh, have have um, come to my desk since mm -hmm. Susan started doing a great job of processing them, finding age range index by Google. All of a sudden, people are contacting us. So oh, the question yeah. of uh, publishing, um, mm -hmm. I can say that one of our cartoonists is Hal Foster. And uh, recently, a commercial publisher has worked with us to re release all of the Prince Valiant uh, uh, cartoons in book form using scans taken from our, um, our engraver's proofs. So it's drummed up support. This kind of thing does I mean it's visual, it's appealing, people want to take advantage of it. Um, on the question of accepting, did the Peter receive on the question of accepting non drawings? That really becomes a kind of collection policy question. Mm -hmm. uh, so here at Syracuse, we have one of the great cartoon collections, but nobody knew about it until we started processing it. Most of the cartoons are from the 50s and 60s. And, 70s. and um, some of them are just cartoons, and some of them are just certain cartoons from a certain cartoonist at a certain time. Others, like uh, like uh, Hal Foster, uh, we actually have papers, so supplementary material correspondence. So it depends on what your policy would be. I mean, there are institutions that collect just cartoons that might take selected bits and pieces. Um, generally speaking, if we were to accept something, I would hope that it would be a cartoon that's significant enough to warrant the entire collection of what uh, LC did with her block. Um, in general, as a sort of professional rule, we don't like to break stuff up. And what we find with cartoonists is a lot of broken up collections. Um, and we do want them Anyway, I'm sorry I've gone on for some time, but I'm very yeah. curious about it. And, and, and one last time is that um, last week was our homecoming weekend here, and we had several cartoonists return. Susan um, oh. had helped some of the faculty in our, our uh, visual and performing arts school uh, put together a small exhibition, mm -hmm. and then we did a show and tell here in this room. And um, what was interesting was that the heirs of many of the cartoonists, in this case, it was... Um, it Greg, was Greg Walker, from Mort Walker. Mm -hmm. who did Peter Bailey, um, and uh, they came back, and they were most interested in what never actually was published. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, for you, how much of those sorts of questions have, uh, have come in? I mean, it's, it's the stuff that's available, people can see. It's yeah. the stuff that didn't make it, and why didn't it make it? Well, that's the whole question of the rough sketches. The curators really push to have the rough sketches digitized. But just in the overall scheme, they just haven't been able to make that argument. But they appreciate the um, scholarly value of that, and that that's what people would like to see. So, um, just if, if, if you're able to say, um, was the, the gift of, uh, from the foundation, was that given after the decision not to take the collection, or was it part of the deal, or would the collection only have been taken if the gift had been attached? Are you able to, to say uh, that? That's always a collection. Yeah, and part. I'm not part of that discussion, right. and um, thank goodness that they were they held out, because we wouldn't have had the resources internally to process that collection um, without being able to hire additional staff. But I bet they would have taken it, <laughs> but don't tell, don't, don't, right, right. don't say that. But uh, yeah. And then the follow-up 
uh, just as about the Library of Congress, because the Library of Congress has its own funding stream from, from Congress, mm -hmm. are you eligible uh, to get additional uh, government support, like Saving America's Treasures and mm -hmm. things like that, or are you out of that equation? Well, it depends. Like, uh, we looked into, for the, when I first came on board, I was working with the Cabinet of American Illustration, and um, we had a very good friend that worked for Bill Clinton, and he started Save America's Treasures. And we were talking about that, and I was telling him, this is perfect, this, this group of, uh, ca the cabinet would be, and he's like, this is perfect, you su um, submit it. And we were very excited, and we put together a proposal and uh, sent it up the line. But they said no, because it was that was executive branch, and we're legislative branch. So there's all, it gets very, very confusing. And yes, we are eligible for some monies and not others, and it, it's a very complicated situation right. you know, that I'm not the person to ask about. Just <laughs> since you mentioned it, I was thinking the presidential libraries, uh -huh. um, are, now they're National Archives, not Library of Congress. Well, up until, up until uh, Lincoln. We have all, all the papers up to Lincoln. Right, but the more the, the presidents who were contemporary with her block, that's yeah. not that's national. No, Library. yeah, that's library. That's that, archives. Right, so you can't sort of uh, logically have little branch exhibitions of her block in the Nixon Library or the or the the Clinton Library or the. Well, Google but we Library. we would lend. We could lend. You could lend. Yeah, we uh, and we lend a lot. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I bet I bet we've lent to presidential right. libraries. I bet we have. They're not cataloged. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it's a process. It's not something that is ever really done. And yeah, there's a there's some cataloging done, but not as not as a collection. You can't say it's cataloged. Okay. <laughs> What's the kind of expected lifespan of a piece on newsprint when it's in a relatively stable sort of environment? Depends on what you mean by lifespan. Like a lot of them now, um, you you couldn't you could it, it doesn't have any fold strength. That's how many folds it takes to break it. So it has zero. So you can't really handle it. Um, but it's still there. I mean, you can still see it. So is it is did it last or not? I, you know, it's it that's that that's a really hard. We get asked that sort of question all the time, and really not one you can answer. You just increase its life if you put it in a good environment and, and do a good housing to it. But how many years left? You know, how many how many years, doctor? Do I have? It's not one we can. Re we really have the science behind to be able to answer. Is that it? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Having collected.